Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah, and I'm very happy to be your host for this magical and fantastic evening. Tonight, we're in for something very, very special. Five young people from our Maltese community have been given the opportunity to share their stories, their realities with us. And please note that these young people are not young people who follow the flow. They are rule breakers and they dance to their own tune. They set the trends. So yes, do get ready for a night of pure uniqueness and amazement. To be honest, I'm buzzing with excitement, most probably as much as our young speakers are, and all of you following. So let's move on. And I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker. She is not a typical student activist. She's actually a very modern day intellectual explorer. And I'm talking about Kara. She's an open-minded person. She's actually like a rocket, ready to shoot and to share her experiences and ignite discussion. Okay, and I believe that Kara is like, come on, come on, come on, it's my turn to speak now. So I'm going to introduce Kara to you with a talk from the heart of the Mediterranean. Passion, purpose, and a promise to Malta. Kara. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for that beautiful introduction. It is indeed a privilege to be here today. So my name is Cara Borja Colina, and I love to learn, and I love to advocate. I would like to share with you today my activism journey and my love for Malta. In short, I am a 19-year-old multi citizen. I consider myself an individual of multiple interests, but the passion from which I drew the most sense of purpose would be the positive attitude related to the philosophy of doing good. From a very young age, I was fortunate enough to be raised in an environment which not only encouraged a growth-oriented mindset, but celebrated it. From academics to simply exploring the world around me, I was taught that knowledge is a gift and the pursuit of it is a lifelong adventure. It is this notion that has really propelled me forward in my work, inspiring me to be part of something greater, something meaningful. I have vivid memories of the countless cultural events my mother took me to. Her patience and openness in this quest of discovery and my sense of excitement enthusiasm, wonder, and curiosity when following a theater piece, seeing a scientific experiment unfold in front of me, listening to live music. Young Kara had a burning passion inside her heart, but she couldn't locate the source of it. But with the support of her hardworking family and with the formative nature of the opportunities that she's been honored to have, I can stand here in front of you today and say with conviction that I have found my sense of place and sense of belonging. I believe that being informed is key to unlocking independence, autonomy, and critical thinking. Education, especially of a civic nature, is vital, yet it is critically undermined. The discussion here today is all about developing into holistic individuals. Individuals who possess and who exercise the faculties of thought and reason. It is about discovering our innate potential, because when humans are placed in an environment which is nurturing, they can cultivate capabilities which know no bounds. So this is the journey the journey of recognizing that potential within ourselves and within other people. It is about fostering the space 
and the environment where that potential can thrive and where we can harness our collective intelligence and wisdom to enact positive change. This is what advocacy means to me. It's about creating an equitable world where we all have opportunities to learn, to explore, and to grow. And so with this shared understanding established, I want to take you on a personal journey where I would like to explain to you the experiences and the opportunities that have shaped my short yet fruitful beginnings. I have always been interested in foreign policy, diplomacy, governance, current affairs. And I remember first representing Malta at age 14 in Linz, Austria, as part of a Valletta 2018 cultural competition called Create Your World. I was also president of Ecoscola at St. Michael's Foundation, and I can clearly remember my classmates and I brainstorming the sustainable benefits of implementing a dual flushing system in the bathroom facilities at school and the articles we'd write for European Week for Waste Reduction. I grin looking back at these moments, especially in the light of the humble responsibility that I have to discuss these pressing environmental matters on global stages, such as the United Nations. But growing up is a slow process, it's gradual. Analogically, we can compare it to a tree, a tree which can only flourish and thrive if it properly anchors its roots into solid foundation. Going back into my environmental involvement, I was also president of St. Aloysius College Sixth Forms Green Council, where my colleagues and I, we addressed local issues, and we invested time and energy into researching and educating our student body on how to take more environmentally conscientious actions. I also spoke and attended the Youth and Climate Conference panel in light of COP26, organized by the Ministry for Foreign and European Affairs on behalf of Agencia Zaza. I am indebted to Malta's National Youth Agency for their exceptional work and their unwavering support. Through the agency, I've been able to not only expand my visibility, but also hone my mission and my vision of doing good. It is through their programs, projects, and the possibilities that they've offered that I've been able to strengthen my will of contributing to society to achieve the common good. Serving as Maltese delegate and committee president for the model European Parliament international selections, this further opened my mind heart and eyes to Malta's involvement in and contribution to international fora such as the European Union. In fact, currently I'm involved in a European Youth Card Association campaign called More in 24, which is aimed to raise voting awareness and focuses particularly on youth empowerment in democratic practices. Focusing on the symbiotic relationship between Malta and the EU, we can result it into a give and take exchange. Malta diversifies the EU through its rich culture and heritage, whilst the EU undoubtedly offers Malta access to the rest of the continent through infrastructure and other resources. So I strongly encourage everyone here who is above the age of 16 to vote responsibly and to make politically informed decisions in the EU elections. While we're on the topic of the EU, I would also like to mention a remarkable individual, Dr. Roberta Metzola, who inspires me. Roberta Metzola is not just a political powerhouse, but she is a mother, she is a wife, she is a sentient human being. She is human, she is flawed, she is bound to make mistakes like every one of us. But nonetheless, to me, she is a beacon of hope and possibility. She symbolizes what every young Maltese girl can be. 
she embodies the values of womanhood, female empowerment, and courage. The same principles my mother imbued me with from a very young age. And I would like to personally thank her for molding me into the emancipated person that I am today, with belief in myself and the good of the world. Bridging the local and the international, I would also like to personally extend my thanks to the Sweetie Local Council for my term as Local Council Youth Ambassador. And I would like to also personally thank the US Embassy in Malta for my appointment as Maltese Fellow in 2022 for the Benjamin Franklin Transatlantic Fellowship, a prestigious program which was a transformative experience for me at Purdue University. Traveling from Mexico to Hungary, France, Turkey, and New York, no matter how far I go, there's always th this intrinsic pull which brings me back to Malta. I wear Malta proudly on my chest through this eight-pointed cross. Malta is not just a dot on the map. Malta is a profound connection. It is a bond that runs through the very core of my being. Malta is a vibrant tapestry of history, culture, language, natural beauty. Malta is a deep duty. Her warmth, her resilience, her undying resilience and spirit, they, they resonate with me. I remain committed to adventuring into different journeys in my life for the good of Malta. I carry a deep sense of responsibility, a duty to preserve her legacy, her traditions, and her value. It is these strong feelings that I would like to convey to you as a promise that any influence, any authority I may have in the future, I will use and exercise for the sole good of Malta. It is not about personal gain, but rather about the protection of our well-being and the preservation of Maltese identity. Teaching me open-mindedness, critical thinking, respect, integrity, tenacity, and creativity, my prior endeavors equip me with assets which I strive to invest in my current position as one of Malta's United Nations Youth Delegates. Malta upholds a steadfast commitment to multilateralism, global cooperation, and peace. Its agenda is driven by its dedication to the Sustainable Development Goals, promoting climate action, gender equality, and humanitarian efforts. Elevating youth voices in global conversations is the main goal of our United Nations Youth Delegate. Youth are agents of change and catalysts for action. The ideas and thoughts brought forward by youth are then transferred to the General Assembly, where youth delegates have the opportunity to involve themselves directly in the mission's work and learn about global policy issues firsthand from high-level diplomats. When I was approached for this incredible opportunity to speak here today, I was first flattered but then overwhelmed at the possibility of being able to talk about any topic I desired. You see, I'm fascinated by almost everything, so that freedom of choice is quite daunting. But then I thought back on all the TED Talks I had watched in preparation for my Systems of Knowledge exam, and believe me, there were many. And from all of them, the ones that stuck with me the most were the motivational ones the ones where people spoke about how their innovative initiatives and creative mechanisms really benefited their community's well-being. So the main message I want to share with you today is don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by the endless possibilities and resources that are available to you. Malta is a very, very small country 
granted. But our big heart and our strong spirit propel us forward, giving us undeniable recognition overseas. Who here has ever felt like they were not good enough? Who here has ever doubted themselves? Who here has ever felt misunderstood, overlooked, or excluded? Let me see a show of hands. Look around you. Almost all of you have felt this way at some point in your life. It is absolutely normal for doubt to enter our minds. But let us not let that stop us from reaching our fullest potential. Our human makeup, it renders us unique, but all interconnected at the same time. So let us envision a Malta and shape it, a Malta that we love, a Malta that we need, a Malta that we want. It is a very ambitious statement, I know. But my mother always tells me, if you don't ask the question, the answer will be no. So let us embrace these questions, not dismiss them. Let us be open to improvement and not shy away from change. So let's make the world our playground, no matter how small our corner of it is. Together, we can be the architects of a brighter, more tolerant, more inclusive world. The time is now, and together, we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cara, for being part of TEDx Santa Venera Youth. I am more than sure that your passion for change is something we can aspire to. It is with absolute pleasure to introduce you now to a very, very interesting young person who happens to wear various hats. She's a student at the University of Malta. She's a dancer. She's also a president, the president of a student organization. And she's a poet. And her poetry excels languages. Believe me, I'm no, I know what I'm saying. Let me introduce to you Clara, who will be sharing her talk with us, called Black Dog Sets Your Home on Fire and Yells, You Are the Flame. Clara. I had a black dog. Its name was Depression. We first met five months after my 18th birthday in a doctor's office, right after a night watching the waves coming in and out, in and out, in and out, and a day contemplating. The crooked February sun hung over in my kitchen, silence radiating through this wasteland, this soon-to-be graveyard. I first met Black Dog when there was no other option but the Xanax, the Seroxet, the Escitalopram. I first met Black Dog because I was so engulfed by it. I wasn't eating, rather, it was eating me. Dinners gone cold, day after day, legs bouncing underneath tabletops over and over and over again. He was waiting for my body to disintegrate, to chew at my bones, build a tent out of bodily ruins, a museum full of trinkets that aren't really mine. So when I unclasped, undressed, unzipped, undid my hems, cut me in half, found a silver thread lining my abdomen for the doctor to take a look. He spotted Black Dog bouncing on my ribs just underneath my breasts. He's prancing along the silk-lined burrow in the middle of my chest. This translucent kind of silence wrapped around my being the most palpable kind of hurt. I said, Black Dog is a marching band 
having a hell of a time stomping away through the corridors of my bones, eating away at my bone marrow, turning me into a bird, this empty sort of being that carries no weight and all of it at once. He asked my mother to take a look at inside of me. My mother's always been impeccable at hide and go seek, but today, as she seeked, she was shocked by this element of surprise arriving unannounced and without hesitation, the hell of this storm, the ache resonating through my ribcage. Because Black Dog makes everything that hurt start with a subtle ache, some days with his hands in my hair and other days with his hands gripping my hair like a rash that does not heal from patch to outbreak, no longer a mere accident, now full-on infection. So he rips through the sickness and introduces everyone to the little girl buried inside of me. He makes me carry her with me wherever I go. Each night, this child, this baby, crawls up and down my downlaid body, swinging from one rib to another. The edges of her fingertips fossilized into the white. She prances up and down my spine, singing songs of girlhood, Christmas, birthdays. So I never sleep, remembering dog, kidnapping child, making her his own, untangling girlhood from womanhood, taking the reins in his own dirty hands. The child screams against the walls of my throat, begging out. But the louder she screams, the deeper I swallow. The higher the pitch gets, the deeper I bury her. And the little girl burns in the acid of each gulp. Each tear uncried, a thousand matchsticks ablaze. Because Black Dog sets my home on fire and yells, You are the flame, the heat of a body on fire tickles my nose. It teases me with burned down curtains, taps that have run out of water, torn up clothing, wasted photographs. I'm having a hell of a time burning through memories till I'm in the red. Black Dog stands right outside my burning home, dancing in front of a corpse on fire like he's fireproof. But the ceiling is about to collapse, and my skin is starting to blister. And the child screams against the walls of my throat, begging out. But Black Dog shows no sympathy. He tells me to kick her in the face, tell her to fuck off, Every time she walks through the door to suffocate her until she turns blue makes me sit with her, limp in my arms, run my pinky over her dry lips, put my cheek against her nose and listen for her breath while he watches, unmoved, not fretting, not crying. And I'm dancing through the panic. I've killed her. And I'm trying not to tear the curtains down, trying not to tear his face apart. Why would he make me do this? Why would he make me walk into my own mortuary, watch the curly-haired, freckled, misunderstood me turn blue with my hands wrapped around her little neck? And I'm here to tell you all of these stories. I want to tell you how bad it was. How bad it was to try to raise myself from the dead, to be Jesus, even though I don't believe in him, to be Jesus, even though he does not believe in me to unwrap my lilac fingers from around her neck, leaving traces of big hands, squeeze blood out of her heart, in and out, in and out, in and out, breathe into her mouth twice over, over and over and over again. So I'm sorry for the mess, the tender smell of my skin after the first shower in days, I'm covered in honey, in this glutinous, untidy mess. But I finally started returning to old comforts, standing underneath blistering water until my fingertips melt into something like shriveled cherry tomatoes, forgotten in the fridge, a wasteland of wear and tear. And as I unfasten, unveil, untie, undress to get in, Black Dog looks at me naked, standing at the corner of my shower and laughs, laughs at the house 
he built a home with no windows, often, me, often giving me a splendid tour while dragging me on my knees. The rooms arranged themselves in my absence, waiting for my big return. I've never seen such patience. Black dog teases me with love. He decorates my crooked spine with his lips, carefully voyaging across my whole body. Because black dog is starved of love, raised as a hungry thing, looking for love wherever he can find it. Love for black dog is a snow globe, always stuck between fantasy and hand grenade. So black dog breaks my bones so people can cradle me in their arms because it knows no difference between what feeds you and what cuts you in half. Black dog shoves my head in a bath of water and demands me to breathe. The water turns mad when he is in it. I'm swimming in tempestuous seas, replacing water with honey, solidifying itself around my ankles. The harder I kick, the thicker it gets. And I'm the only one drowning. Everyone else is only drenched. Black dog insists the colors of my bedsheets are missing me, with grief seeping through me like oil on water, visible and announcing, feeling many things, and none of them slightly. Black dog says, your bed is bleeding, each droplet spelling out your name. There's a lump in your throat, and it tastes like self-sabotage. And we're reluctantly dancing, trying to avoid stepping on each other's toes and occasionally failing. And as I lay my head on the pillow, Black Dog shakes me awake, demanding me to dance again. He drops the medication into my throat. I try to guess why it has such a creepy, tongue-twisting name. And as I crawl out of bed, I trip on my words. I trip on myself. Black Dog is the most stunning acrobat I have ever seen. Sometimes I can barely recognize its shape. He rides the bus with me, teeth dug into my right ankle, reminding me of the time I tried to drive, and he insisted I let go of the wheel, drive right into some wall, telling me how exceptional it'll be to be surrounded by flames, tucking my hair behind my ear, whispering, I will love you if you stay right here. Black dog kicks the back of my knees, I fall, I build a home there. And as I yell fire, I am already ablaze, and I try to pet it dead. Stop, drop, roll. Most days, my body is a cemetery. On some, it is a museum of the things Black Dog did I never want to forget. And this is not a suicide note or a love letter. But when I notice my breasts becoming more and more shallow, Black Dog's head pressing against my breastplate. I dragged myself into this burning home just one last time, tied my wisdom tooth to a doorknob and let it take with it all the answers. I wanted to drink myself to sleep. I left some pasta in the fridge. The floors were clean. White sheets folded at the edge of my bed, my clothes carefully organized by color. Everything was ready. But the silence changed. I realized something is fundamentally wrong with me. It was Tuesday. I hadn't washed my hair in five days, hadn't eaten in about 16. My best friend's voice holding my hand through the phone, my brothers hanging onto me for dear life, black dog wrapped around my ankles because everything I touch becomes sick with sadness. And black dog makes you love in the weirdest of ways. So when my mother says, mind the dogs, do not blame her. She too would lock me up inside my home if she could. She'd sleep better at night, knowing no dog can walk through me, leaving his footprints behind within me, threading through the waters that will hold my daughters. So I'm here to tell you all of these stories. I want to tell you how nice it was to realize that my home is on fire and I cannot put it out using my bare hands. To see Black Dog make me set off the fire alarm, face my haunting, stay with it, stick with therapy. Realize that March and June and October are really bad fucking months. Learn to breathe, 
with a head submerged underwater, take it two weeks at a time, that running on a treadmill that is stuck and forever plugged will eventually be the end of me. So I never fail to forget how Black Dog made me love myself as a childhoodless child, always this half-grown adult, dragged the poetry on my wounds, and he's lingering near the door uncomfortably, begging me not to let him go. Black Dog fraternizes a fork with a spoon as he eats away at my tongue as I try to find the words, because the truth is, I don't know what to do with it, but to write it, transcribe it into poetry, and I've tried to unfold it and bring the corners together like a worn-out blanket, fold it again into a perfect rectangle. I've tried to toss it into the kitchen sink along with the dirty cups as if it were a pan, scrub the handles, the bottom, the insides, wipe it clean, dry it on a newly bought rack. I've tried to throw it into the washing machine along with the whites, wondering if it would come out pristine too. So Black Dog cries on my poetry like starched, white, Sunday clothes. But the hem of the last stanza drapes far too low past his ankles, the metaphors too tight along his puffed chest. Is this one about me? Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara, for moving us with your words and the insights you've shared. Keep it coming. Well done. I'm sure many of us in this room have been told every tiny step counts, right? And our next speaker can definitely vouch for this. He's got the coolest origin of story. I'm talking about Thomas. Thomas was born with an amputated right arm. Now, you might tell me, but what's his story about? Well, I'll leave it up to Thomas to share with you his story. The power of incremental progress and the value of patience. Thomas. So, just before we get started, um, Very quickly. Now that is something that I didn't do overnight. So, good evening everyone. My name is Thomas, and I stand here before you today to, teach, uh, to speak to you about uh, the power of incremental progress and the value of patience. My life hasn't been one of instantaneous success or overnight transformations, very far from that. Rather, it's a journey defined by progress, persistence, and an unwavering belief in my capabilities. As you can see, I was born with an amputated right arm. In fact, this wasn't something that my parents were aware about. No ultrasounds, no tests had shown that I'd be born with an amputated right arm. It has undoubtedly shaped how I view myself and how I view the world. However, I never let it stop me. I, many people see it as a limitation, but I'd rather see it as a challenge. A unique challenge that every day I wake up and a new lesson is learned and I'm taught something new every single day. Despite the challenges posed by my arm, I've always been very deeply involved in my community on the bigger scales, like competing at the Paralympic Games, competing at World Championships in swimming, reaching the highest level belts in judo, and making it to the final rounds of the football national team, and even smaller tasks, like doing my lace, wearing a watch, doing my buttons. These all have taught me something. Every milestone was reached with my condition in plain sight. But when I set my heart on a goal, no obstacle, visible or invisible, would be able to stop me. A quote from one of my favorite philosophers, a Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, says that, do not think that what is hard is impossible to achieve. Do not think that what is hard 
is humanly impossible. As if it is humanly possible, consider it to be within your reach. My journey has been very much about embracing this philosophy, because even though I do things very differently, it is not impossible. Nowadays, with easy access to lots of information and lots of data, we get caught up in the desire for instant gratification. We want something, and we want it now. However, that should never be the case. It is countless steps taken day after day, year after year. If I win the morning, especially a Monday morning, I would, pro I would have probably won the day. If I win the day, I'll win the week. Win enough weeks, and you'll win the month. And if you win enough months, you win the year. And enough years will lead you to a very successful life. Each step may seem very insignificant on its own, like one penny in a piggy bank. However, those put together will lead to something much bigger. There's one particular challenge in my life which I recall very vividly, and that is the famous two-story rope. Um, on Sundays, I used to attend extra sessions for judo to improve my game. It was where the higher-ranked belts used to train, and they used to see them warm up on this rope, climbing, using their arms only, from sitting down. It was always so impressive. And I said, how cool would that be if I would, if I would do that one day? Years passed, and uh, I find the challenge right up in front of me again. It was in a gym, a two-story rope. Now it had a bell at its peak. I gripped on. I said I'd be, I was full of determination. I gripped on. Maybe I lasted 10 seconds, and gravity reclaimed its hold. I tried again and again. Weeks had passed. Slow progress. Each climb, I did learn something new. And... Uh, I had reached a personal milestone a few months in, and that was halfway up the rope. Little did I know that climbing up the rope required just as much energy and then climbing down, as I don't want to hurt and fall. I wanted to do this every single day. A um, few weeks passed by, and uh, eventually, after a minute of hard work, it led to this. So, that, that was probably one of the longest minutes in my life, if I'm being honest. Um, a few efforts later, um, I wasn't happy with that. That was the first step. It was a, one more step, one more coin in my piggy bank. I want to do it better. I want to do it faster. And a few more tries eventually led to this. Nice storm all the way, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> I always had to hear that bell ring. I had to always reach out and hold on, even if I fell. I just needed to hear that ring. Um, uh, James Clear the author of Atomic Habits, puts it simply. He says that you do not rise to the level of your goals, but you fall to the level of your systems. You're only as good as your daily habits. You're only as good as the efforts you put in 
day by day, year by year, to reach the goals you want. Every action, no matter how small, is, is a vote for the kind of person you want to become. There's no way that you're going to turn up one day and do everything you desire to the level of efficiency you want. It is going to take lots of time. For me, every challenge I faced due to my physical condition or physical disability became an opportunity to grow from. Each fall taught me something new. I grew a bit more resilient and became a bit stronger, both mentally, physically, holistically as a person. My part was never about competing with others as much as I enjoy it. I like the element of competition. But it was more about competing with myself, being a better version than I was yesterday, just that 1% better, each time adding to, the, to my book that is my life, writing a new chapter every day. Obviously, there are many times of doubt and frustration. Not wanting to get out of, the, out of bed isn't something foreign. It was times where I used to doubt myself and say, am I really going to be able to do this? I've spoken it out into the world. Now, is that even possible for me to do? However, each time I used to get closer to my goals and say, all right, it's not too bad. In those times, the value of patience came in. The value of being patient even though results aren't showing. And those are the days you need to turn up the most. So, obviously, I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way. I want you to imagine, right now, I want you to imagine what motivates you, what keeps you going even in those times, what keeps you goal-oriented, what keeps you positive in times of frustration and overwhelming. I'm sure you all know what it is. Now, I want you to create a visual token of that thing. It could be a, an armband. For me, it's a little token. It could be a photo in your wallet. It could be a, a photo on your phone. Whatever it would be. Now, with that said, when you look at this, think of it as a new push. Think of it as a switch. That as soon as you see it, you're going to get back on track and say, all right, this happened. Now I'm looking forward to see how I'm going to do better. Another quote from a famous philosopher says that if you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but it's your perception of it. It is how much you want it to affect you, and you have the power to revoke that. Our perception shapes our reality. Instead of viewing my arm as a limitation, I chose to see it as a source of strength, a source of motivation, a daily reminder that I've overcome every single challenge I've reached so far, and I'll continue to do so for the rest of my life. My journey was one filled with successes and setbacks, positives and negatives, ups and downs. But through it all, the values of incremental progress and patience always kept teaching me that even though maybe I'm not feeling my best, I'm just doing a bit better. I'm doing a bit better than yesterday. Maybe today's not the day. Let's try it for just one more day. So to each and every one of you, I say this. Embrace the power of small steps. Cultivate patience and perseverance. Recognize that your journey is unique, and it's unique to you, and that's what makes it beautiful. And always remember, that habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. In conclusion, I encourage you to recognize the small victories in your life. They are the building blocks of your success story. And remember, with consistent effort, belief, motivation, discipline are the most important, and consistency, no goal is out of reach, no dream is too big, and nothing is impossible. Thank you. Well done, Thomas. You are truly a very profound inspiration to us. I hope that my determination keeps on growing as much as yours is. And maybe one day, I myself will be able to go up that rope you went up. Anyhow, wishful thinking, maybe. So, are you ready for the next captivating speaker, Chloe?
Have you heard of Chloe? Let me tell you something about Chloe. Her journey through the National Youth Council of Malta and the European Youth Forum is a testament to her commitment to impactful projects, from championing the rights of minority groups to advocating for climate action, Chloe has left a mark. Her experience at COP27 and her leadership roles in various international organizations speak volumes about her dedication. Ladies and gentlemen, Chloe with her talk, but why? The literal translation to anyone here who doesn't understand Maltese is, I don't know what fear is. My late grandfather, God bless his soul, used to say this phrase whenever his life got challenging. And he passed on to my mother, and my mother says this phrase whenever her life gets challenging. So it comes as no surprise that whenever my life gets challenging, my mother's phrase to me is, Manafshinu Biza. But as a young child, I never fully grasped the how. How can someone not know what fear is? Distinguished guests and colleagues, my name is Chloe Lauren Kauke. I'm a newly turned 21-year-old human being, law student, active citizen, and also a work in progress. I am an inquisitive young adult, coming from a strong lineage of women that tested social barriers and stood up for what was right time and time again. I have been inspired by people from all walks of life, from literally all corners of the world, from the United States to Palau, and from different times, because that are present here, to Maya Angelou, for example. I have been taught to look at challenges in the eye and not feel any fear. As a student in the Maltese educational system, we are taught about a very important historical episode that happened in 1565. I'm assuming that at least half of the students that went through the Maltese educational system know what I'm referring to. This episode shifted the trajectory of Maltese history and Maltese culture. Basically, the islands of Malta were attempted to be conquered by the Ottoman Empire in what is known as the Great Siege. Malta, with the help of the Knights of St. John, won the nearly four-month siege because the Maltese are strong and look challenges in the eye and not feel fear. But why? Why not feel fear? How does someone not feel fear? Could it actually be? So I did a little bit of research. The truth is that unless you have some sort of specific permanent brain damage, everyone feels fear. It's necessary for survival. According to a 2019 article published by the University of Alabama, some types of fears, such as that of heights and insects, are still linked to the instinctual need for survival. Today's stimuli can obviously be very different to what used to be the fear that we're referring to for survival here. However, the bodily response is still the same. Our physiological response to fear can be intense. Some people are just better at handling it than others. I have been active within my regional, national, and international community for nearly a decade now. It all started with attending English-speaking unions, public speaking, and debating workshops when I was around 12 years old. The truth is, I've always had a lot to say, and I love talking. So when the school approached me to join these workshops, I immediately said yes. ESU made me feel empowered for the first time in my life. They made me feel that my voice was heard and was loud enough to get heard, that my voice was worth something more than I ever thought, that my passions, human rights, were something I could work on. The injustices around us could also be something that I could work on. However, public speaking or glossophobia is considered to be the number one fear of the human population. People prefer being in the casket than delivering the eulogy in a funeral. I don't know if anyone knew that. But why? Studies show that it stems to one main thing, anxiety. 
Anxiety tells me, the speaker, that if you don't accept what I am saying or enjoy it, that I am immediately shut out. I can imagine that no one really tries to catch that kind of feeling. I enjoy public speaking. I enjoy it so much that I nowadays compete within the public speaking sector. I started competing in regional and national competitions, and I'm currently the JCI Europe public speaking champion. I face a tough world championships in a very few short weeks, which my phone likes to remind me of. And the truth is, I'm scared. I'm terrified. Fear is present, and in a way, I'd be extremely worried if it wasn't, because it's a big deal. Because whilst my grandfather and my mother state, I don't know what fear is, I could never relate to them, because I do know what fear is. Fear is what got me into activism. Fear of losing my rights, my safety, my country, my world, is what got me to start talking louder and clearer for what I stand for. Fear that one day my values will be questioned and tested is what made them cast in iron and made me so unbending. Fear is one of the main indications that I am doing things out of my comfort zone. And I tend to get claustrophobic, so the comfort zone is quite large. It's an indication that I'm growing and learning. And it's an indication that I'm engaging with different peoples about different topics that challenge me to be a better human being. Being a representative of Maltese and Godstein Youths internationally is not an easy feat, I must admit. I am aware of the responsibility I hold. I know some of the struggles that my peers and I are going through, but I am also well aware that some of my peers are going through challenges I cannot and probably will never fathom. Going to COP27 and representing Maltese and Godstein Youths was an honor. However, I do not remember being fearless when I was asked to speak about climate change, sustainability and youths in front of an audience of that magnitude. But I do remember the anticipation that I felt, that I could help something, that in this case, youths, people, the cause. And then the anticipation of growing through that experience kept me intrigued, and ultimately, it overshadowed that fear. It is what made me say yes to be the Maltese delegate to the European Youth Forum and the Southern Youth Councils. It's what made me say yes to being a Maltese Commonwealth Youth Exchange Ambassador and subsequently and currently a Royal Commonwealth Society Fellow. It's what made me say yes to go to COP28, which will be happening in a few weeks. It has made me confident enough to moderate climate sustainability panels in front of Women to Women, which is basically an organization that I am a proud alumni of that inspires young leaders, girls from the ages of 15 to 19, emerging leaders coming from every single country in this world. It is that anticipation that made saying yes to being the president of Malta Model United Nations exciting and not just plain scary. The same anticipation was channeled by 12-year-old Dwight Chloe as she sat and wrote poetry about the world around her, which was eventually published. It is the same anticipation that I felt when I was 16 and doing MEP for the first time, leading to be a committee president and actually then helping out with the presidency. It is also that anticipation that made 18-year-old Chloe say yes to be part of the National Youth Council. Three years later, I still form part of it and dedicate my time to speak and write and research about what needs to change. It's that anticipation that I feel as well as I prepare for the JCI World's Public Speaking Championships. The same anticipation was there when the life choices I had to make were presented as black or white, and also when they were presented as green and slightly darker green. It is the same feeling that inspired movements such as, but not limited to, suffragettes, the civil rights movements, the gay rights movements, that the injustice present would not fade if fear overtook. One of my best friends is a physics student. And earlier today, she reminded me that power is calculated by multiplying the mass with the velocity. It's a formula that I believe can be adapted for the activism sector. Mass can be quantified as the amount we have to lose. Velocity, the speed till time runs out. And power is... 
power. But why? Why did my grandfather say man off shinobiza every single time his life got tough? I'm sorry, but it just does not resonate with me. So, nanu, oma, <laughs> I'm changing your phrase. I'm going to say, which translates to, do not let fear stop you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. And I hope that each and everyone here in the hall really takes this phrase with you back home. Do not let fear stop you. And passing on to the next young speaker we have, Jacob. Jacob will share with us his story that defies limits and embraces resilience. I'll give the floor to Jacob and his talk, Pay It Forward. So, hello everyone. I would like to uh, present, um, introduce myself. Um, and this time, 10 years ago, I had just survived a very rare brain infection, which almost killed me and left me uh, partially paralyzed, paralyzed on the left side of, of my body. And today, and after my trauma, um, we went, me and my family went on, went on to create a support group called Survivors Mota, where we, we help people that have been through trauma or, still are, or are still going through trauma to be able to find support. And uh, we have also initiated a, a, um, a project where we give out free coffees and sandwiches to places like ITU and PICU. Certainly, Mama Oncology Center, and we also give out free sandwiches and coffees to uh, shelters of victims of domestic violence. We also created a pet cabin called Reunited, which was opened on the hospital grounds of Mater Dei Hospital, and uh, that took us about seven years to open. And uh, now, this year, we have a new project called Project Revamp. It's where we have uh, chosen two balconies at the St. Mom Oncology Center. And we have refurbished the, 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 the balconies, and we brought in new furniture for the patients to be able to sit down and relax and forget about the hospital environment inside, inside the St. Mamo. And uh, a new project I have uh, started, it's on a personal level. It's, uh, I, this month I just started university, as I would like to be able to help young people that are, are less fortunate than others, to be able to better themselves and actually create a future out of their lives uh, with my support. And uh, basically, I have been studying youth and community studies for the past three weeks at the Faculty for Social, social Wellbeing. And, um, I would like to thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jacob, and may you keep pushing boundaries and redefine what's possible. Okay, so we've reached the end of this event. However, I believe that we have found a treasure chest, right? Full of inspiration, of creativity, and of determination. And just as much as pirates hold on to those treasure chests, let's hold on to them. But let us also open the treasure chest to share with the people we come across. I thank you very much for being here with us and wish you a very good night. Thank you.